Okay, welcome to the next lecture. Uh, today we'll be doing some quite, I think quite simple, but very useful uh, thing called low 3 diff colorings, or p-centered colorings sometimes. I mean, there's not exactly the same, but they're very closely related, p-centered colorings and uh, low 3 diff coloring or p-3-diff coloring. So because we'll be using today 3 diff, let me recall things that were on the first lecture. So in the first lecture, we defined 3 diff of the graph. Uh, so the most intuitive definition for me is the definition of like recursively decomposing the graph by hitting some vertices, deleting some vertices, and decomposing the connecting components. Okay, so we have the definition that the tree depth of this tree of an empty graph <coughs> is zero, and the tree depth of G is maximum over connected components. And the uh, tree depth okay, if, if G is disconnected. And if it's connected, we try to remove one vertex. So we get G, one plus two. We pay for the vertex we delete, and we delete one vertex in the best possible way. Yeah, so uh, if G is connected. Yeah, so this is like, um, uh, so we can like independently resolve every connected component and to resolve a connected component we delete one vertex and recursing to connected components etc and our tree depth is like the depth of this recursion yeah so if we fr if we make a picture of how this recursion works we have our graph and we split into connected components then in every connected component we delete some vertex then the graph got split into connected components maybe one into maybe into three then maybe this one doesn't get split then in every connected component we delete extra new vertices and maybe some of them again split into pieces then in every connected component we delete another vertex okay and maybe some of them got split <coughs> into pieces and then delete all the vertices and this is like our like decomposition tree that that's how we decompose the graph that's all how we decompose the graph that this is the vertex we delete and it's split into connected components after deleting them and by the fact that we always recursion to connected components means that they cannot be edges like across these boundaries. Yeah, they cannot be edges like that. They're only edges connecting. They're only edges connecting parents, uh, ancestors, and descendants in this in this graph. So, so we said that this is true about the graph. This minimum height of a rooted forest. Uh, which co closure contains G. Contains G. Yeah, so what do you really do? You draw some rooted forest, which is like your decomposition tree, and you want every edge of the graph to be like between some ancestor and descendant in this rooted forest, not across different branches. And this is like tree depth. I mean, the equivalence of this definition we'll discuss in the first lecture, but it should be quite clear from the definition of this picture that this works like this. And there was some measure of the graph that we told, <laughs> that we discussed that it's like, Larger than true if, I mean true if is smaller, like more small, more, small true if is more uh, is less than small, small true if, like more restrictive graph measure than true if, um, but it was somewhat useful. And in particular, on the first lecture, we connected it to the we coloring numbers. We had this. I will put it. Okay, I will move up here. Uh, we had this lemma from the first lecture. Lemma from the first lecture that the three level graph is exactly the the like main right like without we call it number without any radius bound. So if you want an ordering of the graph and you count how many earlier vertices you can reach by paths where this vertex is the minimum of the path, then this will be exactly the tree of coloring. And there was a lemma proven on the first lecture that this is and this one, this wasn't completely easy, but the intuition was that the correct ordering for this we coloring number without without uh, the bound on the length of the paths is just top down order, some top down order in this rooted forest that you want either like to make the like, layer by layer or like top down in every tree, but generally top down order in this tree is, uh, corresponds to a good ordering here because you exactly see like your ancestors. Your ancestors are the guys you're seeing in this uh, in this week in this order in the in the weekly sets. And now what you can say here now is that okay, uh, 
weak coloring number if you don't give any bound on the length of the path is more or less the same, if, it's the same exactly if you give some very large bound which you will never exceed like the number of vertices of the graph and then the weak coloring <coughs> numbers are like larger and larger as you decrease the radius I mean smaller and smaller as you decrease the radius because you have got like less path to consider so the weaker surfaces are smaller and then in the end you have got your uh, uh, with, uh, with of one, which is the degeneracy of the graph. Okay, so tree depth is like, so we have got this scheme, and like tree depth is in some sense the, uh, I mean, not in some sense, in like the precise sense is the limit of the weak coloring numbers of the radius crocs. Okay, and now, okay, so this was, this is the re re recalling tree depth, and let us now make a um, an example of some technique that was an inspiration for us, for um, for us, but for like the mm, people doing the theory of graph, sparse graph classes, for what we'll be discussing today. So let's discuss. Let's make a detour to planar graphs. So let's go to for detour to planar graphs. And let's discuss something which is called the Baker lay Baker's laying technique. And let us make um, the following. Let's do um, the following thing. Let's assume that we have the planar graph G, this planar. And let's try to find a large independent center. As large as possible, let's try to find large independence. But independence in planar graphs is an NP hard problem, so we are not really trying to do the best possible, but we want some approximation. Let's just Let's say that somebody gave us some epsilon and we want the one minus epsilon approximation. That means that we want to find an independent set that's like at most one minus epsilon times smaller than uh, the optimal one. That we want to be as close to the optimal as possible. Okay? So let's try to do this. And the trick is as follows. Let's put P to be the inverse of the epsilon, like what is inverse? So one over epsilon C. Okay? Okay? Let's put any vertex of the graph. Let's take any vertex of the graph. So let's go here. And let's take any vertex of the graph as the root vertex. It's like starting from the vertex. And let's do BFS from, from B. From B. And let's say that layer E are exactly these vertices that have to be standard exactly E. I. Okay? So this graph looks like I will draw this picture. There's B. And there's like layer one, layer two, layer three, and this is very tendent. This is a good picture for what we are doing, but of course this can be like this will be la layer four, but then this can get get connected. There can be like a an aisle here of layer four, etc. But let's keep the picture uh, clean as this one. So these are like layers: layer one, two, three, four. And let's now like make this layers like let's think of this layers modulo p plus one. Mm model of p but let's do it no, model of p is okay so let's do layers model of p so let's think of uh, uh, the, let's define w i of w i will call it j this is like union from uh, k equal zero to infinity l uh, i uh, j p plus j plus p k that means that I'm taking like, it is, and this is like for j between 0 and p. So what I'm really doing here is that I'm taking modulos, modulo p, so I'm taking like this layers, the index modulo p, and I put like coloring the graph, you can think of coloring the graph with, modu with like modulo p, what's the distance to the root, to the root v, what's the distance to the root v, modulo p. That's our colors. That's weird. Okay, so we're doing like coloring the graph, and well, so we have got like p distinct, uh, p distinct size, so like w0, so wp minus 1. This is a partition of p of g, g on g. And the crucial observation is that, hey, there is one, one of the sets, these are p sets, p was 1 over epsilon, so there's one set that contains only epsilon fraction of the, of, of the optimum solution. So if we fix some i star to be the optimum solution, there exists some j such that the size of the wj intersection our optimal solution is 
smaller than epsilon times the size of the peak. So, so there's one layer, one not layer, but one like this, one color that contains only epsilon fraction of the solution because we have that one over epsilon colors and they are disjoint. Okay, so there's only epsilon fraction. So let's try to guess the J. I mean, try all possible Js. So let's look at, let's try to find, try to find for every, <coughs> for every uh, J from zero to P minus one, try to find maximum independence set in the graph with removed layer J. So we're removing color J and trying to find maximum independence set. And now, so this will be a one minus epsilon approximation because we are, for some j, we are losing only epsilon fraction of the pink solution, which means that the, in this graph there exists, if we make the correct j here, in this graph there exists a maximum independent set of size one minus epsilon the optimum value, okay? But we need to find something optimal here, okay? And the crucial observation is that we will do it because what we are doing, we are taking this graph and we are removing every pith layer, okay? So the connected components of this graph are like rings of thickness uh, p minus one. Okay, they're just rings of thickness p minus one. Uh, well, if you want to be precise, if you look at one such ring, so there can be more things and another something deleted. So if you look at one such ring, like here, if you look at one such ring, you can think of like, hey, delete the outside boundary and take the inside and contract onto V, contract this BFS3 onto V, and you get this ring becomes now a graph of radius p. So this graph, like this g, every connected component. So I want to say that every ring between two consecutive layers we deleted, after the, we contract the inside, becomes a graph of radius uh, p. And we had the theorem on the first lecture. I don't know. It's definitely in notes. I don't remember if I exactly discussed it. That if the planar graph, if g prime is planar and has radius at most p, then it has got true if smaller than 3p plus 2. This is it's proven in the notes. I don't want to prove it because it's not that relevant for the topic of the lecture. So the true if of a planar graph is bounded linear in the radius. Okay? Bounded linear in the radius, which means that this ring has got true if order of p, which is order of 1 by over epsilon, which is a constant. So if somebody gives us a constant epsilon, this um, and it, this ring has got this truth, and now if you know how to make dynamic programming algorithms over graphs of one and truth, which is something we slightly discussed today during tutorials, not very deeply, you can know that you can solve here the maximum independent set in time roughly 2 to the p times n, which is 2 to the 1 over epsilon times n. Okay, so the time is exponential in the truth, but this is 1 over epsilon, and there is a um, linear factor of, of the graph size. Okay, so what you can do here, mm, so you have that divide, divide, so this technique says that, hey, let's sacrifice every pith layer uh, in the, mm, let's sacrifice every pith layer in the BFS tree, but if you choose the, like, the remainder wisely, I mean, you try every possibility, but for some choice of remainder, you lose only epsilon fraction of the solution, and then the remaining graph gets simpler, namely it has got three bounded by one over epsilon, so we can do dynamic programming and solve problem optimally in the remaining graph. Okay. So this is like Baker's layer technique. It was very influential, and this type of tricks appears in like almost every approximation scheme for problems in planar graphs. Uh, but let's try to like do something with such a trick. The proof, proof techniques will be very different because we'll get a much weaker result, and unuseful for approximation result, by the way. But let's try to make a statement what we really did here, and then try to adjust the statement to the sparsity world. Okay? So I'm going back to the left board, and I'm trying to make a statement what happened there. So this theorem we really proved there. So the same thing you can really prove there is the following. Given planar graph G and then integer P, integer P, you can find in polynomial time actually find polynomial time a coloring, a coloring 
this is like the partition to WJ, yeah, the coloring F uh, from P to P into P colors, okay? Uh, such that if you forbid some color, I will write it the following. For every set of I, set of P, which is not everything, so I think it's strictly larger than P, for every set of colors, if you look at the guys induced by colors, the true, the, if you look at the guys induced by these colors, okay, this tree is bounded and actually is order of size of i. Because that's like the width of the rings you can obtain using i colors. Okay? So what we did, did here is that uh, I mean I can write here properly free size i just. Okay? What we get here properly is that okay. We can find um, mm, a graphs and that's one over p. It's one over ten up there, but an integer. You can color with p colors, such that if you request any set of colors which is not all the colors, then the tree of the graph induced there is bounded nearly in number of colors to request. There. Good. So this is mm, mm, something, and it's very useful. The useful thing for the coloring for the approximation was that it really was. If you even lose one color, you already get this very strong structure with bounded root graphs. Okay? This is something we won't have in, in graph of bounded expansion. I mean, in graph of bounded expansion, no awareness, we won't get as good property that losing one color from the coloring will be, uh, we, we will already give some strong structure. It will be on the other hand, it will be like a small subset of colors. Will be will have any small subset of colors. We have got strong structure, but if you take too many colors, you can't say anything. So let me state the theorem. That we prove today. The theorem we prove today is that if uh, G is a class of bounded expansion, then for every P there exists an M such that for every graph in this graph class, yeah, so there's any, for every integer, there's an universal constant for the graph class, such that for every graph, you can color the graph with n colors. So like for any threshold that would be useful here, there's a number of colors, such that any graph is colorable with number of colors, so that for every h, which is a subgraph of g, which is connected subgraph, either uh, if either and j is the number of, and i is the number of colors. Yeah? So this is like the size of the f of g of h. So like how many colors it uses. If i is smaller than p, then the true depth of h is the most i. So this is a bit on a bit different thing. If there's a stress put. Yeah. If I have a class of bound expansion. Okay, if I have class of bound expansion, um, if I have got class of bound expansion, then uh, hey, I, if, give me a number of colors you're interested in, like subgraphs induced on some number of colors, then you can find a huge number of colors. This will be like really huge. I mean, this blow up will be like really horrific here today. And so we, there's a huge number of colors, so that every graph from the graph class can be colored with a number of colors. So that whenever you take i colors, i less than p colors, the connected components of these i colors have got small tree depth. Like you can think of it like this part can be replaced is like for every subset of the number of colors of size at most p. Uh, the tree depth of the graph induced by the by these colors is as small as the, the size. So you can phrase it this would be like more similar to this table. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this is really the same if you think it for a while, but it's the, when you use it, this type, this formulation is a bit more usable, but it's really like, I mean, it's really the same. So that if you look at some number of colors, at most P, then the graphs induced by these colors is, uh, is, uh, okay? It's like, is, uh, and uh, it's like the number of three depth of this graph is at most number of colors you requested. Okay? And we'll be doing really something, if we'll be really proving, and I will put it here because I have this assignment, a third thing, 
an IMINI, so this is like uh, this, this, and this. And we'll be proving something stronger. So this is equivalent to this. So this this is equivalent to this, but we're proving something stronger, namely that for each each of G connected, either there are more than p colors up there, and then we can't say anything. There are more than p colors, or there's a vertex of unique color. Or there exists like there exists some color i such that is exactly one. And that means that there's some color which is just exactly once on this subgraph. I mean this is the root of the tree of the composite here. I mean let me just put that this one this 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 definition is easy. I mean, this direction is easy. If you have got, uh, for every connected subgraph, either it uses too many colors and you can't say anything. Here you also can't say anything. Or if it uses less colors, then there's a vertex of unique color. So hey, let's take this vertex, let's look at the subgraph, take this vertex of unique color, delete it, and recurse into connected components. Hey, you have got one color less, and you're, you again can apply the same, the same statement. Take every connected component, find the vertex of the unique color, delete it, and recurse into connected components. And in this way, this inductive statement proves that if you use any i colors, you get through different modes of i. Okay? So what we will be really going to do, we'll be really proving this one, and this one implies this one. And um, uh, tutorials will show, which is quite easy, that if you have a coloring satisfying this one, then you can get a coloring satisfying this one, but you may need more, a bit more colors. I mean, you may need to like add some shades to colors to break up some ties. So let me make the uh, it formal. I will let me make the definition. Let me break the definition. P is a graph, and P is an integer, and F is some coloring. Okay, I mean, this is like, I will put just that here. Okay, up there, and if we just coloring, then F is P3 P that coloring. If this is like A, if this statement has says, yeah, so for each A which is connected, Mm, if we take the number of vertices up there. Okay, then if i is less than p, then the trigger is at most i. Okay, up there, this is like picture of coloring. So whenever you take at most p colors, the connected commands up there, or connected subgraphs up there, using only these colors, have got three def at most number of colors requested. And p centered, if every Connected. I mean exactly this one. Yeah, either uh, the number of colors is less than more than p, or there exists an i set of f uh, of p of h, and b of h intersection f. f um, the side of f one. The side of the second. Okay. So the summing and this says that in classes of probable expansion you have got uh, uh, p-centered colorings. For every p there is a number of colors that there is a p-centered coloring using only this color. Because of course if you color every vertex with a distinct color, this is a p-centered coloring. But what the statement says is that for every graph class has, for every p there is a universal number which depends on p, which depends on p. And such that, uh, and on the graph class such that you can color with this number of colors and get a p-centered coloring. And what I just argued here is that any p-centered coloring is clearly a p 3 def coloring. And given a p 3 def coloring, we show in tutorials that it's quite easy to obtain a p-centered coloring, maybe using a bit more colors. We'll be using some like, shades of colors to do this. Okay? So this is the statement. And what we want to prove is that we want to prove that a class want to prove, here, want to prove. Proof. It exists about expansion. And for every C, there exists M. For every G, there exists a P centered coloring. 
Okay, that's what we want to prove. Okay, and so it will be relatively simple, but let's try. I mean, to, it, there. I mean, there's like one idea in this proof. So let's prove it. One idea in the proof, and the idea is that um, let's do. Let's look at. Let's take this graph G, and let's look at the. The idea is to use the coloring numbers and to take the ordering sigma, which is optimal for a very large radius, namely we are looking at the radius which is 2 p two to the p minus 1. So we're looking at the at ordering, which is like very, very, uh, which is like good for a very, very good radius. Okay, and now this is a constant, and this will be, and we will use, I mean, our m will be the recoloring plus one. That's our number of colors. So this is a constant. Yeah, I mean, if somebody gave us the graph class and gave us p, then the recoloring numbers <coughs> are constants, and this is like a constant number of colors. Okay. And now we take this ordering and do the greedy coloring. Yeah, I mean let's green color like f of i is the f of v will be this thing, not in f or oh, I would say this thing f of w for every w which is in the ring we shall be set with this rate minus one of uh, g sigma. Okay, so what we do? We make we color guys from left to right in this ordering. Okay, and whenever we want to color the guy, we look at the weekly each other set, which is somewhere here, and we color this guy with a different color than all the, all the guys in the weekly each other set. And of course, like the choice of M should have already hinted how I would be coloring the graph. I mean, this is the number of guys in the week. Oh, actually, we can do one less, yeah, because the weekly each other set was actually, uh, the weekly each other set includes your according to our definition, yeah. So we don't need to count as this plus one here. Yeah. So because we can have set includes the guy here, so we look at the uh, uh, w than w. So we can have set uh, which obviously includes the vertex from which you start. So you're looking at all the previous guys, look at their colors, and choose a free color for the guy. Okay? So we have this property that we cho choose a coloring that uh, whenever one guy is in the weekly shall set of another guy with this super huge radius, then the color shall be different. And now we want to prove that this is actually a p-centered color. So I claim this is a p-centered color. Okay, uh, so this is our definition. We take this huge radius, and now I'm moving there to the other side to prove it. And the crucial claim Is that uh, let's do it this one for every uh, i between zero and uh, p minus one, the exponent of zero. This is like crucial case. Yeah, and for every q, which is a path on two to the i vertices. G, uh, Q uses more than I colors. Okay, so if I have a path on two to the I vertices, okay, for I between uh, to the path P minus one, uh, zero to the P minus one, then I need to use more than I colors. F use, Q use, I mean F on Q. Q uses more than I colors. Okay, this is the claim we want to prove. And we'll prove it by induction on R. I for I equals zero. Q is a single vertex. And we use more than zero colors. That was easy. Okay? So now take a long path. So like E is greater than zero, and we take a long path. And it has got two the I vertices. Okay? But this 2 to the i is smaller than 2 to the i p minus 1. 
Okay, so this path, this entire path is within the scope of the radius of the coloring we have. Okay? Yeah, because we have two pi minus one vertices, so its length is strictly less than two to pi minus, two minus one. Okay? So we are like even well, we have got one one distance margin between our bound, but we'll use this margin later. So this path is completely within our radius bound. So let's take V on this path, which is sigma minimum. So let's take a vertex V, which is the earliest guy in our ordering. Yeah? So if you look at our ordering, let's do this one. Okay, this path, I mean, this path nicely looks in the graph like this, but in the ordering, the path looks like this. Uh, the path looks like this, and vertex V is the earliest guy. And now the point is that this V is the weak reachable set of everybody else. Okay? For every guy on the path, the observation is you know, here that, that for every guy in the path, V is the weak reach of a set mm, Okay, this guy is the weak reach of a set of everybody there because he's the earliest and this path is the correct connection because it's sufficiently short Okay, so this guy is in the in which of the case which means that this guy has a unique color on Q Okay, which means that V has a unique V has which means so which means that F of V is different than f of w for every w on the path different than u, than that, than v. Okay? So every guy on the path has got different color than v. So there's one half, yeah, so we have got the path, let's break the path into like q1, then there's vertex v, and then there's q2. Okay, so let's remove vertex v and the path breaks into two parts, and one of these parts is at least half of the original one. Okay, yeah? If you take a path of length to the i, uh, to the i, remove one vertex, and one of the paths have got to the i minus one vertices. Okay? Like q1, or I mean the side number of vertices. And that is done to the i minus one, so we can use induction. Yeah? So this part, so say, say, say q1, so here, you get more than i minus one colors, and this is an extra color. So we have got more than i colors. Okay, so q1, q1 uses more than i minus one colors, and v is another color. And v is another color. Okay, so there's one extra color. Yeah? We have the path, but remove one color, and the induction goes. Okay, so any path of length up there is like good. Uh, so any path of length to the i uses more than colors. So let's try to mm, more than colors. So let's try now to conclude the proof. So let us move here. And let's. Uh, I mean, I think we're familiar with definitions. So let's assume. Let's take and let's, let's do the following. So let's let's use the definition as an of bulk out. So let's h be any connected subgraph. And like, what's the natural choice of the guy, uh, which is like the unique color, the earliest in the ordering? I mean, that's how it works here for the paths. Yeah? So let's be, be the earliest x sigma minimum vertex of p of h. And now the, okay, is the guy of unique color. I mean, if the guy is of unique color, we win. Otherwise, there's another guy that's like of uh, the same of that's uh, of the same color. So uh, we are done unless so we are done unless there exists some other v of u inside uh, v of h such that f of v of v equals f of u. Okay. Okay. So what do we do? I mean, what does it mean? I mean that there's like. Hmm, that there's, there's an, unless, I mean, we want to claim this one, but this, we can think of this one, this, we can that this guy has a unique color, unless we use too many colors. So assume that this guy is not. So we want to, now we want, what we want, we want that f of p of h is more than p. Yeah? We want to say, hey, if there's another guy of the same color, the only way to have is that h is really large and uses more than p colors. 
Okay, that's what we want to prove. Yeah, that if this guy is not the set, is on the center, it's not the guy of any color, then actually we use too many colors. Up there. Okay. So what do? So let's take a path from V to U. So that's Q. Let's do the path from V to U in uh, H. So let's take this path. And mm, well, let's take this path. So there's this path B. And this goes somewhere to U. Okay? So let, let me call this path B, sorry. And let's take Q to be the prep first. Two to the p minus one plus one vertices. Okay. So maybe this path. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, the first observation is that uh, v is in the weak reachable set of g sigma u, but with the radius being the number like the length of the path, length of the piece. Okay, the length of the path. Okay, so this path cannot be too short. Because in our ordering, we chose uh, a guy which, I mean, whenever you are in a future set of radius to the p, p minus 1, you have got distinct colors, but they are diff the same colors. And because v is minimum, guys, so this v is also the minimum on this path. I mean, because v is minimum in the right edge, so v is not on the path. It's also minimum on this path. That means that the length of this path needs to be larger than 2 to the p, mi uh, p minus 1, because otherwise, mm, the length of this path needs to be larger than two minus one, otherwise, I mean, they cannot have the same colors. Okay, so I can choose the prefix of this path of length two to the p minus one. I mean, two to the p minus one plus one vertices. Okay, and look at this prefix, and now say the following: Hey, v is the minimum guy. That means that v has got its own color, and this color doesn't appear here. Yeah, because v is in the weak reachable set of these guys with this distance, which is our distance we chose for the coloring, okay? So what I'm saying is that for every w in q, in v of q, uh, if v is different, is different than u, then uh, f of v is different than f of w, because, I mean, this distance is short enough that we keep track of the stuff uh, with our weak coloring, with our weak coloring number, okay? So this guy's, this guy's with me with which I've said, so here are we using different colors, but this guy, but q minus q without the first vertex, has got length has got two to the p minus one vertices. Okay, so we can use our claim that says that it uses at least p colors. Okay, because it's more than p minus one, at least p colors. So our claim says that on q minus v we use at least p colors, and v has got another p plus one, p plus first color, and we are done. There are more than p colors. Okay, so there was a like careful like counting in our argument. I mean, and I made the numbers so that they work well, but. If you want some more slack, you can do it differently, but I mean, we observe that, hey, there's this path from V to U, and they have got the same colors, and V is the minimum of H, so V is always in the weak reachable set if you go around the color, but the radius increases, but because we chose our coloring to be like this thing up to radius 2 to the P minus 1, for the first 2 to the P minus 1 vertices, you have a different color than V, and then our argument kicks in that says, hey, but here you need to use more than p minus one colors because of our index argument. So there are p colors here, and v is the p plus first vertex color, and you're done. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. So we are done. We have proven our theorem. And the important part what we had is that we are real algorithmic. So let me wipe it out. And let me recall the argon things we have doing, we are doing here. Mm -hmm. What we can do, well, I mean, we, what we really had, we, we, what we really had, well, I mean, this was like how to get the coloring, so how to get F, you just compute sigma to be a v, with small equal to the p minus one of g sigma, so you want a small. I mean, this was our number of colors. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, never used that we are really doing optimal weak coloring number, optimal ordering. We just said, hey, you can have an ordering with this being bounded, and uh, well, mm, with this being bounded, and uh, the weak coloring number. Uh, mm, 
Mm, and with being bounded, and this is exactly the number of colors we're using. I mean, whatever ordering you do, and you take the greedy coloring that just takes the color different than your original set, you get uh, a piece of coloring that would be proved here, and the quality of the ordering, the quality of the ordering, ordering uh, gives us how many colors we're really using. Okay, so that's it. So how? What can we do? Well, we had admissibility approximation. Yeah. So we had we we was a p-time algorithm to get an ordering with admissibility sigma is like smaller than uh, with this radius, yeah, so this p minus one, so this p minus one times the real admissibility of g. Yeah, so there was like a radius approximation of admissibility which was like sort of greedy, really, yeah? Greedy packing, greedy everything. And then there was the lemma saying that we we coloring number with some radius bounded by some blah 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 of admissibility. Maybe J sigma. With some similar radius. I don't remember exactly numbers, but there was an argument saying that hey, if admissibility is small for the ordering, with coloring numbers is small for the rings. Maybe the radius draw. I don't remember exactly how it went. You can check in the I think second lecture. Um, what was there? So you can approximate admissibility in polynomial time, and if you have small admissibility, you have got a small weak coloring number, so you can use this ordering to get your coloring number. But as you see here, uh, as you see here, uh, it's really that, I mean, the blow up of the constant is super huge. Yeah, what we really did, we take the, we took the, um, we took the weak coloring or the weak, or the weak coloring number with ordering with exponential radius in the number of colors we want and then use admissibility approximation which was really to the radius there was like admissibility to the radius here if you remember correctly and the exponent was the radius really so there's again this 2 to the minus 1 ex exponent of the admissibility here so the weak coloring number is a constant but not a constant you're going to use in an implementation okay so what really happened here, I mean, now let's us, uh, okay, so before I go into some like deep, some digression about like implementing this type of things, because it's not really hard to implement, it's just how well it will work, it's like a different thing, but let's just try to use it first, okay? Let us try to use it first. So let's go, uh, let's go to the following setting. For this, it's really useful. So say that one of the tasks that computational biologists are doing in many places, and I, I mean, don't ask me about the details of the motivation, I may, may, may summarize, but one of the tasks that appears in many bioinformatics applications is like counting small subgraphs. Yeah, so I have got big graph G, which is like a big like network, how, I don't know, some genes interfere, or some phylogenetic network, I mean, a lot of things. This is like large, but sparse for some reasons, it's just sparse, and I have got a tiny pattern. Tiny pattern, and think of like pi vertex path, think. Yeah. And the question we want to ask, <coughs> how, many, how many times H appears in G? How many H subgraphs? Okay, how many there are H subgraphs? And for some small patterns, like, you know, short paths, triangles, and many other things, it turns out that this is like some sort of correlated with some good quality or some like other properties of the network, and just like a real number that somehow has got some meaning for some applications. I don't really know. So, I mean, like, the specifics of the graph, how it's formed, and how this graph is, depends on the like, like the spectrum of how many small subgraphs there are compared like to how many there should be in a random graph or something like that. There's some, some sort of like, for some reasons in some place, important measure. So let's try to count it. I mean, we want to count it. And if you do it by brute force, you get V of G to V of H. And we just try all possibilities. And this is like um, quite a lot. Sometimes some heuristic help, but this is too much. If this is large and this is like five, to, a lot to the five is quite bad. I mean, if you have a large graph, which is with like a million vertices, you can afford n and log n or n times larger constant, but you can't really afford n to the five. Okay, so let's try to do different thing. Let's try to get a size of f 
to be V of H centered colored, or even treated colored. So let's look at treated colors, okay? We want to have a dot treated coloring, okay? And now let's guess the colors, I mean, and it uses M colors. And let's define it P to the number of vertices up there, okay? This is the colors. So let's guess the, let's do the following, let's guess the colors and then count inside the colors. This requires some intrusion exclusion, but let's do the following algorithm. For every set of colors of size at most p, count uh, count the number of h, h subgraphs in g by f minus one of i, because this has got triggered most size of i. Okay. So what I want to do, I want to for every set of colors, I want to count how many subgraphs will be there. In, in uh, using only these colors, because every subgraph will be counted at least once here. Okay, every subgraph will be counted at least once because it uses the most p colors. Okay, now some subgraphs that use less than p colors will be counted a few times, and you can do some inclusion exclusion magic to get the correct count in the end. I don't want to dive into details. I mean, everybody who has seen inclusion exclusion principle on the basic mathematics in the first year can figure out the correct inclusion exclusion formula given all these numbers for i up there. Okay? So I don't want to dive into details. I want to go for this task. Okay? Inclusion exclusion is not the topic of this lecture. Okay? So let's this this and then do it and this compute this ones, count this ones, and given all these numbers, uh, this numbers and i for every i, do some magic inclusion exclusion. Do inclusion exclusion magic. Okay, inclusion exclusion magic. This is not very I mean this is not very complicated to do it. Okay. So uh, we have got this task, but now the trigger is bounded. And this is something we do on the exercise. Somebody was attending like the Prometheus algorithms course, or even was going at the advanced algorithms course up here. We have shown bounded tree for these, like graphs on bounded tree, how to like, find free coloring of graphs of bounded tree, or like find maximum independence of graphs of bounded tree. We'll do some reminders of tutorials, but like this one, the, the theorem is like easy, like if h and there is like G, we are giving GFH and uh, we are giving a three decomposition of G of width at most W, at most W, then you can count H copies. Uh, I, would, I can say that there's like some constant depending, like some constant depending of H and W times this number of vertices of the graph. And this constant, if you dive into details, what you really need, you need to remember like trace to do like something like two to the order of size of h uh, plus w probably log size of h plus w. I mean, this would be like this type of order constant. It won't be like a tower. It would be like something exponential in the width and the number of vertices of h. Because more or less, you need to remember was like partial trace already constructed. It was not about the counts there. Uh, and this will be probably a bit more. I would write zero of one because handling numbers will be difficult. Yeah? The DP will do linear number of steps, but there will be like large numbers to add on, and I don't want to analyze them here. So let's keep it like that. Okay? Uh, yeah, so this is something we'll discuss in the lecture. So we can do. So what you can do, you can do for every set of colors, you look at this guy. This guy has got small tree depth. So in particular, it has a small tree if you can give it this tree depth. I mean, this coloring, if you get a synthesized coloring, you get the tree depth decomposition for free, yeah? Because it's like you delete this, the unique color, records delete the unique color. So you get the tree depth decomposition for free from the standard coloring. So you can get the tree depth decomposition. Tree depth decomposition scanning from left to right is a path decomposition. And you can do dynamic programming. If you really use, and we'll discuss it briefly in the tutorials, if you really use the fact that there's a tree depth decomposition underlying it, you can do this in polynomial space, so you don't need exponential space to do it. But that's a more advanced trick somewhere. But what happens here is that, hey, I can use low tree depth colorings with bounded tree of dynamic programming routine to count the number of small patterns. But what's the complexity of this algorithm? Well, in the end, what we are doing here, the dynamic programming here, I mean, h is p, and the width of the decomposition is p, so this will be like really two to the order of p dot p times 
times the size of the graph. I mean, times some arithmetic, which I don't want to dive into the details. Okay? So this the exponential dependence on p is like p to the p here, okay, in the same program. But before, before it, we're iterating over all subgraphs here. Inclusion and exclusion is simple. This is like some f of p, which I don't want to dive into this. But here, I mean, we're doing it for every p. So this is times m to p. Yeah, we're choosing p calls actually at most p. Okay, so this is roughly m to the p. Okay, and this was this huge number, the weak coloring number, uh, which was the admissibility to the power radius, which was exponential in p. Okay, this is like, this is this m here, and it's even power to p, but to start from this is already a big number. Okay, in theory. So there was actually a paper who did, um, there's actually a paper who did this pipeline and took some really biologists, things from biologists and see how it counts, uh, things there. And it turned out that do, even by adding some heuristics to like this pipeline to get coloring numbers, the number of colors we get is too high. I mean, this is not, this turned out, no, I mean, despite some effort on some, some experimental group, they weren't able to push this pipeline to get a usable number of colors in this slow tier coloring. So this is a very beautiful way of proving some stuff. But this is um, mm, this very beautiful way of proving stuff, but this is not the way you're going to implement stuff, unfortunately. Uh, the same group later did a uh, subgraph isomorphism, this is called sub or counting subgraph isomorph, counting subgraphs. Uh, problem directly from weak coloring orderings for like radius 2r or 3r, uh, when uh, p, 2p or 3p, and then you need to do inclusion, then the exclusion exclusion starts to be really tricky up there, but you can do it. And this was way more efficient, mm, actually. But this is like the clean, the theory clean way of doing counting subgraphs in linear time in the graph size times the mm, times some horrible function of the size of the pattern you're looking for. Okay, so I mean, so that's like the segment here. Good. So that's about counting subgraphs. Now I'm going to check my time. <coughs> Good. So now I'm going to back to the theory because what we have really proven here. Uh, is that bounding, uh, bounded expansion graph classes have got to go good p centered colorings or low tree colorings with constant number of colors. Now I want to argue that there's actually like, this is if and only if. I mean, if a graph class has got a good, um, has got a good, um, like for every radius there's a good bound of the number of colors, then it needs to be a bounded expansion. Okay? So let's prove it. That's I will just write the, I don't remember the numbers, so let me take the numbers. Uh, I want to say that, uh, so the lemma I'm going to prove today, the lemma, uh, okay, if there is, um, hmm, if G has, if F is two uh, P plus one, three of coloring, coloring of G with M colors, then the topological graph R of G is bounded by some function 2P uh, with M to P as well. Good. Okay, that's this one. Uh, 2 is P. I use P for the number of colors. P how used R in the notes. That's why I'm confusing them all the time. But P should be done with colors, Michael is wrong. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do here is that, hey, if I have got a low tree depth coloring with a small number of colors, I cannot have too dense topological minor. Okay? So like, as a corollary, I will prove it in a moment, but as a corollary, we have got that this, for if G is a graph class, then the following is equivalent. Equivalent uh, one that G is a bounded function, and mm, the statement we have for every number of colors, for every uh, center, there is this number of colors, this will be graph class, there is this tree that following G with at most 10 colors. Uh, With more than colors, yeah? So we have the direction that, that way, that was proven already, if you can bound this much up there. 
And this one proves the other thing, yeah? If for every radius there's a bounded number of colors, then there's a bound of polygon brats, which means that there's bound expansion. Okay, yeah. If you want like the bound of the P radius P grads, then you look at how many colors you used for 2p plus 1 uh, tree of coloring and take another blow up in the constants, sub constants, so you get your uh, density of mm, depth p topological vectors. Okay? And this is actually quite simple. Let's do it. Well, well this, so let's take the minor model. Yeah, let's have g, f, and uh, as so, so here, and m. Yeah. And let's take some topological minor. So let's have some topological minor. So f is depth p topological minor. And yeah, that means that every h in h has got his p of p h, which is over to p, and every h h g a g h h h has got his uh, its path, the path in g from from P of P to C of H. Okay, and this of length mode, of the correct length, which I don't know exactly, okay? So now let's classify the paths according to the set of colors they're using, okay? So like for every, uh, um, for every, like for every, let's, uh, E, for, for every set of colors of size, P minus one. Let's take E i to be this uh, edges of H such that uh, F of T of G H is a subset of I. Yeah. Or a bit of, I mean, I can classify it according to exactly the colors, or like supersets of colors. It doesn't really matter for this argument. Like for every set of colors of two P minus one colors, I look which edges use these colors. Okay. And I look at the set, and of course, because every because this path has a bounded length, okay, of, I have got that the sum of i e i is e of I mean every edge falls into at least one of the sets. Okay, every edge falls into at least one of the sets. So what I want to say, want I want to prove that the number of e i is bounded by two p and you know, over this edge. But if you look at only one class, the one color class, you cannot have too many, uh, you cannot have too many, uh, mm, too many edges. Yeah, because then, I mean, this is like the number of eyes we are using here. Okay, so we want to use, say that for every fixed colors that you're allowed to use of the paths between the guys, you can't be too, too deep, you can't be too, 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 you can't be too dense. Okay? This implies this, because the union of the edges is this one, so the number of sets i is this one. So what we are already proving here, let's go back here. What we are proving here. Okay, okay. So what I want to really prove here is that uh, I want to prove, so what I really want, I want to prove here that the number of edges of a graph, of a graph in G, is bounded by the number of vertices of the graph times three depth of the graph minus one. If the graph is not empty, yeah, I mean for empty graph when three depth is zero, this is like false. So. That's true. Okay, and this is exactly what we want. Yeah, if we take just some set of two p minus one colors, three depth is bounded by two p plus one, and that means that there are actually two p uh, that are v of a vertices may be less. But the number of colors, uh, but it's really this is more two more plus one, so the number of edges most this like this. Okay, and this is obvious. Let's look at the decomposition. So this was the decomposition we drew at the beginning of the graph. This is the decomposition, and where are the edges? Like every, let's look at every edge and let's count it from the lower endpoint. I will find a little score for that. Now I recall I have it, I have it. Okay, like this is the decomposition, and like let's count every edge from the bottom endpoint, yeah? So every edge might be, the graph may look like this. Okay? Okay? 
but every guy, every vertex has got at most three depth minus one edges upwards. Up. Okay? But we're done. I mean that's the proof up there. Every, if you count every edge from the lower endpoint, you count every edge once, but the row, every endpoint counts at most three depth minus one edges. Okay? So this is like so the low three depth graph are sparse. I mean the average not, the average degree is lower than three depth. And then you have got M choose to P map plus one choice of the colors you are going to use for your edges in your topological model, so you are sparse. Good? Good. Okay, so we prove our theorem. Uh, that was like a digression, but let's like now, I think I'm going to wipe out this claim soon, uh, but I'm just checking what's the time. Very good. Uh, still, I mean, that's like exactly how, how we expected this to last. So now I want to make an introduction. So what, what's happened today? We introduced the toll of low 3 depth colorings. It, the proof was quite simple. It was quite tricky, but not very complicated to prove that weak, uh, co good coloring for weak reachable sets with very huge radius are good for the um, colorings. There's a slight difference between centered colorings and 3 depth colorings. In some, in the, when you are using stuff, the 3 depth colorings are so very sufficient, but the proofs already give the centered colorings, which in some sense already in the coloring include the 3 depth decomposition. Mm, so that's sometimes more useful. So I would rather recommend you to think about centered colorings rather than 3 depth colorings. I found them a bit more useful, but in the literature you can find both. We proved that, okay, good weak coloring ordering gives good uh, low 3 depth coloring. And we proved also in the other way around that if you have a good coloring, low three coloring, you cannot have two large topological minors. I mean, uh, that was the lemma that was just before. So, like, this is like yet another characterization about an expansion graph classes. I mean, you had characterization no dense shallow minors, no dense shallow topological minors. There was the neighborhood complexity, and now we have got uh, there were weak coloring numbers, and now we have got like there, there's a uniform bound on the number of colors you needed for p-centered colorings. Okay, that's another thing. And now why this is useful? I mean, this was very useful to make a theoretical statement. There's a linear time algorithm to count small subgraphs. That was a very uh, nice statement. But, um, yeah, that was a very nice statement. But, um, okay, if you, now I recall what I wanted to say about this arithmetic. If you count size of the graph as a constant, number of subgraphs is like n to the this constant, so the, all the numbers are like of logarithmic size, I mean the number of bits are logarithmic, so you can treat it as like unit operations. Good. Now I'm not lost with the with the with the R set there. So it's really linear really time. Yes, so you have got there. But now why this is useful is that I want to make some I want to say that the statement that we can count subgraphs is slightly more general, it's way more general, and this will be like Michael will mutilate you in the few lectures with this part that this is more useful because you can not only count subgraphs, but you can do some logic evaluation on the on the graph using low 3 colorings. So let us make a statement. So let's look at graphs. And I want now to write a formula saying that there's a P5 in a graph. How do you write that there's a P5 in a graph? So A is just P5, 5, and how do we write the formula there is, there is, is a P5 in G? Well, let me write this formula for you. So write this x1, the write this x2, the write this x3, the write this x4, the write this x5. So that they are different. Okay, I should have chosen shorter path. Because now I'm going to let me write this. Consistent from the order. Ten. Good. Mm -hmm. They're different. They're edges. Yeah, they're parallel different. And they're edges from x1 to x2. And there's an edge from x2 to x3. And there's an edge. From x3 to x4, and there's an edge from x4 to x5. Cool. Okay, so this is the formula which you all understand. 
that says, hey, there is a P5 in the graph. There are five vertices. I didn't put qualificators that are in vertices. Let me keep there. Right? There are five vertices that are pairwise different. That took 10 clauses. And then there are another four clauses and the other edges between consecutive guys. Okay? So what do I really say? I said the following segment. So let's look, think of the following logic on graphs. And this will be like first order logic on graphs. In those simple graphs, well, I can do, there exists a vertex. I can do for all vertices, so x, x is the vertex. So I can do quantifiers over single vertices. I can do edge tests. I can do equal, non-equal. Okay, that's like the atomic operations. I can check edges. And I can do all the Boolean operators you want, like and, or, not. Okay, you want, I, implication, I'm not just like, not be sure about that. So this is like first order logic in graphs, and they just expressed a formula saying that, hey, there is like, a, hey, there is a P5 in the graph. Okay? So let's now, now um, uh, okay, so with this mouse, you can write your formulas. So there's like a formula, and you can write your formulas. And formulas have got three variables, yeah? The variables that are not over quantifiers are like outside. There's no quantifier for these variables, okay? So there's a formula psi, which can go some three variables. <coughs> Okay, three variables. And what we have really proven, what we have really proven, if you go into details and check the dynamic programming and all this stuff, is that if psi is existential, existential means that you cannot use this one. You cannot do this one. Okay? If it's existential, then counting satisfying assignments can be done in some horrible function of the of this formula and uh, of this formula times n in bounded expansion graphs. Yeah, because what do we do? Well, this is an existential formula. It's going to do some existential statements over number, some number of vertices in total. I mean, there's <laughs> some number of existential quantifiers up there, okay? There's some number of existential quantifiers up there, but it's bounded, it's a constant. So say that it has got, it uses p existential quantifiers, yeah? Use p existential quantifiers. So let's take a p-centered coloring of this graph, okay? Guess the colors, I mean, iterate over all choices of colors where the, col where the colors you guess are the colors where the satisfying assignment really works there. And like iterate over all, mm -hmm. and iterate uh, and like, and then look, observe them in bounded three depth graphs, counting, uh, counting satisfying assignments is actually a tedious dynamic programming algorithm without any ideas inside. Okay, I'm hiding inclusion exclusion underneath there because there's up there if you want to count, if you want just to check if this is satisfied, this is easier, you don't need exclusion exclusion, just guess the colors used by the satisfying assignment and then go and find it by dynamic programming. If counting, you need to do some exclusion exclusion, so this is complicated, so maybe think of finding or checking satisfiability. But what really did is that subgraphs is something that I like a lot to think about because that's a graph theoretic. I, I mean, I'm not very keen on logic, so I prefer to think of subgraphs. But what really we did is that we did um, we did like some FO model checking for existential formulas there. Okay, so we. I mean, if you do for all, things start to be more tricky because now your tree of coloring doesn't work, so you need some logic tricks up there. And this is Michal's job next week to show you that. But, uh, uh, but uh, this is like, uh, this is what we will prove today. And now, so as we are here, let's now like expand our language into like, let's now go to the go into like more key lines of logic. And let's try to, I mean, this is the intuition you should have, but now let's introduce some formalism. Because we are, what you want to do, you want to sometimes work on not graphs, but graphs with some vertices called terminals. Or like graphs with few colors on vertices. Or like guys with some edges are red and some edges are black, etc. And these things all should handle. I mean, if the graph really has got edges black and red, then you add a predicate red edge, black edge up there, and everything goes through, okay? 
So let's make it slightly more general so that you can use it for like, I know, colored graphs or something like that. So that goes us into the land of signatures, structures, and Gaffman graphs. So a signature, sigma, I mean, signature sigma is the symbols we have here, yeah? I mean, so what we are doing, I mean, we're doing standard logic, we're doing standard logic, we're doing standard operators, but we are doing this edge thing, okay? This is like a binary predicate, yeah? A question, does these two guys are connected by an edge, okay? There's a predicate equal, non-equal, that's for free always, that's always, but one is predicate. So this is like a set, set of symbols, symbols like uh, relation symbols, R plus the RP. So you want to know, hey, I will be using symbol edge, and it uh, gets two parameters. It's RT2, okay? Or I will be using like a, a terminal that asks whether a vertex is a terminal, and this is like RT1 thing, okay? Okay, so with RT, okay? So this is like signature, this is like the language. Hey, I'm going to use this uh, buzzwords in my, in my sentence, okay? In my logic, okay? And now a structure is, a structure is like a real implementation of these buzzwords, yeah? So a structure A, it consists of universe U. So this is the set over which we do quantification. So this is like the vertex set in our sense. Yeah, this is the vertex set, thing vertex set, really. This is like the vertex set, this is the universe. And for every symbol R, you get a, a, an evaluation. Okay? So you get to R, which is really a subset of uh, U, times u, u of r t r. Yeah, this is really like an r t of r relation inside the structure, yeah? This is like really the set of edges of the graph, directed edge, so like the set of terminals, like if this r t one, this is just a subset, okay? So think of like, a, so for example, if you color the vertices with red and blue, okay, that means that you're in your signature having two pre unary predicates, is this vertex red, is this vertex blue, and then, a structure really says which vertices are red and which vertices are blue. Okay? And if you want to have edges, red and black, you have got predicate red edge and blue edge, and in the structure has got a subset of pairs of vertices that are red edges and a subset of pairs of vertices that are blue edges. Okay? Good. And now a Gaiffman graph. Okay. Is that, hey, take this as a vertex set, and connect vertices that appear somehow, somewhere in any relation, yeah? So the vertex set is the universe, and UV is an edge. If there exists a relation, uh, and a tuple in this relation, so that both U and W are in this tuple, in this tuple, okay? So there are some, the, I connect the vertices whenever some relation puts them in a tuple that's in the relation, I, I mean, I take a weak tuple and quickify it, okay? And if you now worked, work with our proof, you can get that if you have read that, mm, that existential and for more tricking. Okay, so that's me. FO is the logic we had. We can only quantify over over elements of the universe, single elements of the universe. This is first order. Existential, not for all, for all is forbidden. We don't know that symbol. Model checking means that I don't want to count, I want just to check whether it's there is a five or not. Can be done, I mean can be done in time some constant depending on the formula times the size of the structure. The size of the structure counts like, I mean, how you write it up. I mean, the size of the universe plus the size of our relations, blah, 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 written down, times the subscription. If in structures plus this guy from the test bound with expansion. And what we really say here, hey, what does it mean for every graph class of bound expansion? If you are given a 
structure whose Gachman graph is in the graph class, then you can just exercise further checking in this time when this function C depends on the bounded expansionness of the graph class because there's this uh, there's this weak coloring number hidden here depending on the graph class number. Yeah? So that means for every graph class bound expansion, there's a function C and an algorithm that given a existential formula and eternal formula and a structure of whose Gachman graph class is in the graph class checks satisfiability of this existential formula in linear time, time some huge constant that is good. And if you like mutilate the entire uh, proof, you can get this one. I don't do it. I really showed you all the important parts. The, all, everything else like some logic blah blah to get this statement. What Michal will be doing, Michal's job for the next lecture is to cross out the word existential. Okay, so Michal lecture for the next one is to cross out existential. And also he will highlight what happens in the lower dense graph classes. In the lower dense classes, everything is fine. But here appears one class if you if you take now another color and you want to write here lower dense, you need to put one class epsilon here for every epsilon. I mean there's like some slightly super polynomial, it's a slightly super linear dependency here. Good. Okay. So I think I did the introduction to logic that Michal wanted me, and Michal will be like, Michal's job for the next week is to cross out the word existential, and that requires some work on the boundary of logic and graph theory. Yeah, so Michal wants to allow for all. And note that our proof breaks down, because now, uh, I mean, if you write exist x such that for all y, I mean, for different x you choose different y, so the different set of colors is different for different x's. And like you can't really get like p colors where everything interesting happens. You need to be slightly more careful. Good. Any questions? Good. So I think we can stop the recording. And.